Hello, I'm Bob Tribe and welcome to another edition of Valley to Vietnam. Our guest today is Dan Murphy, who served as a platoon leader with the Marine Corps in I Corps of Vietnam. So welcome, Dan. I don't want to shake hands, Bob. Oh, I've got a cold. He's got a cold, yes. I I'm would not hate to take it. you down. Can I move my chair a little further away? Just kidding. Uh, so, Dan, you were born in Jacksonville, Florida, but you're not a Floridian, really. Well, I'm a half Floridian. My mom was from Jacksonville, oh, okay. Mayport, a little fishing village outside Jacksonville. Um, but uh, my dad was a Marine, had come down from New York, and was stationed at the Naval Air Station there. Uh -huh. Met my mom, and um, I was his insurance policy when he went off to serve in the Pacific Theater in World War II. Oh, okay. And so... You lived there for a short period of time, and then I want to go back to one thing, and that is, you, you mentioned your father was a China Marine. Would he you, was. Would you tell us about that? Well, after the war, um, there were Japanese forces scattered throughout Asia who had never been beaten. Um, they had never been in active conflict um, against the U.S., and uh, there was a big problem. They had to do something about that. So we took over administration of a lot of areas, um, and including in China. Um, to stabilize the situation, to get the Japanese repatriated. And so he did not come back after the war. He served at Okinawa, and then they shipped them right out from Okinawa over to China to uh, stabilize the, the main rail line uh, running from the coast to Beijing. So he served for some period of time after the war? Probably a year or so. Okay. Well, see, I, I always, I'd heard the term China Marine, but I never knew exactly what that was. Right. So. Um, so you live in Florida a short period of time, and then you're going to go to New York. A couple of years. My father came back. Um, we went to New York to live. He became a police officer, and we lived in Queens until I was 10, and then moved out um, onto Long Island to a little town called East Meadow. I've heard of it. So what was growing up in East Meadow like? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the sterility of suburbs, um, but they're not a bad place for a kid to grow up in. The uh, island wasn't completely developed, and so there was still a lot of uh, countryside to go and see. Um, school systems were great, and um, it was uh, a nice place to grow up. So you graduated from high school in New, New Meadow, and then what? Then I went to Queens College for about three years. Okay. Um, I was, uh, as I told you in our pre-interview, not a successful student. Uh -huh. I was, uh, I liked the things I liked, and I uh, didn't work hard at the things I didn't like. And so, at the end of three years, I, it became obvious I was not going to graduate from college because I couldn't meet the language requirement. And so, I dropped out um, at that point. And um, that would have been what year or when? Uh, Nineteen. 66, I guess. A bad time to get out of college. Yes. Um, the war was just starting to ramp up. Uh, the draft was really ramping up. Um, there wasn't even a, a lottery at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, I was uh, fairly certain that my draft board would find me um, A1 prime uh, beef to right. be shipped off. And so, um, given my options at the time, if I signed up for the Marine Corps, which, since my father was a Marine, was not a bizarre thought for me. Uh -huh. They would um, allow me to defer my entry until after the Christmas holidays. Um, and so that's the route that I went. You also attempted to join the Peace Corps. Before, yes. Um, looking for things to do, I had gone down and uh, attempted to join the Peace Corps, but I had not acquired any uh, useful um, certifications out of the educational system and I didn't have any skill set and so they were not interested in training me. Unlike the military, which is probably one of the biggest educational institutions in the country, I mean they train millions of people over time um, right. to do all sorts of jobs and so it's, it, was, it was ironic to me that um, we didn't have any money as a government to train people to join the Peace Corps with a useful skill, but we could certainly uh, train them if they were going into the war corps. Right. And you volunteered for a four-year term versus a two-year term because of the recruiter. Well, and my own naivete and gullibility. He right. had um, told me that uh, probably would be a better idea, Dan, to sign up for four years because then you'd have more choices about what you would do in the military. 
An old story. Yes. Well, it all worked out okay. I, I thought it was kind of interesting, the fact that you mentioned to me that because you were raised by a Marine, boot camp really wasn't as tough on you as it was on a lot of other guys. Yeah, as I noted, um, it was a little scary when you got there. Yeah. Um, a lot of yelling and shouting. But when we lined up for the first um, discussion, which really isn't a discussion, the first lecture in the in boot camp, we were in a long squat bay and we we're all lined up and before the chief DI came in to give us our orientation talk, I looked out of the side of my eye to the left and the right and I saw folks fidgeting and uh, fooling around and I figured, okay, I'm gonna do all right here because those guys are going first. <laughs> Perfect. I, I remember my own instances I came into my basic training company and they're screaming at us we come up in trucks and people are tripping off that deuce and a half and landed on their faces and then they're standing at attention for this long period on the asphalt and pretty soon you see guys passing out and hear these steel pots hit the uh, and nobody paid any attention to them. it was just like okay that's natural and tough but I know that feeling there are casualties in a war you know? <laughs> so uh, and your basic training essentially was at Paris Island? Uh, boot camp was Paris Island. That's the way the Marine Corps does things. Uh -huh. um, I don't know exactly how long it was, six or eight weeks. Right. And then um, infantry training regiment was at um, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Uh -huh. um, and that's uh, at that point you're then sent off if you're going to a school to get some education, you go from there. Or if you're being assigned to a unit, you would go from there. You receive your basic infantry training, which all the Marines have to go through, uh -huh. um, regardless of what their ultimate job is. And you're going to go to a specialty school on radar. That's correct. I, that's the orders that were cut. Um, I had taken, uh, the, you know, they give you aptitude exams, um, and uh, they were um, delighted uh, to have some somebody who could uh, meet their criteria for going to radar school. And I went out to uh, San Diego. Uh, the Marine Corps Recruit Depot is there, but there are also um, some electronic schools. And um, entered into a, about a year-long wow. um, school um, to learn how to maintain and operate an aviation radar. Um, it was a portable radar system that could do three-dimensional tracking, tell you not just where the plane was um, in two dimensions, but also what its altitude was. Uh -huh. um, and it was all inside a, a blow-up bubble um, with the radar set inside so it could get packed up and we had to learn you know, how to pack it, how to maintain it, how to troubleshoot it when there were electronics problems and then prepared to go anywhere in the world to you know, set the thing up. Um, so that was my, my first year um, out of uh, infantry training was at that school. Did you ever practice that skill? I never, um, when I graduated from the school at the same time I had um, applied for an enlisted commissioning program that they had opened because they needed more officers than they could get out of their traditional sources, ROTC and uh, things of that nature. And so my uh, orders to go back to the, the um, OCS in, in Quantico had come through um, and I was sent to a casual company once I had left uh, the school. So the timing was such that there wasn't any any actual orders cut to go to a, a, an outfit to use this year's worth of training, which probably would have got me a darn good Peace Corps job if, uh, yeah, no kidding. if I'd had it at the time. Yeah. Now, what are the what were the components of OCS that you went through? There's various types of training or stages. Or right. Whatever. Unlike the, the Army, the OCS um, for us was a relatively short course, maybe six weeks or so, and essentially it was not as much training as winnowing, um, trying to figure out who would be acceptable and who would not be acceptable. Right. Some of the same uh, basic socialization has happened in boot camp, um, but at the officer level. And then once you graduated from OCS, you would then go to a, a school also at Quantico called the basic school, which was a, a longer school, maybe 20 weeks or something like that, uh -huh. and um, actually learn the military skills necessary to, um, to be a second lieutenant. Okay. And then was there, you had some additional training. You had a, 
a recon course, I think. That was after the basic school. Right. Um, I had done fairly well. Um, they graded you in, in all the characteristics, both academic and um, leadership skills and all that sort of stuff. I had done fairly well, and so I had the choice before leaving to go to a school. I had always been interested in, um, in getting into a recon outfit, and so I went to a school in, in San Diego for 10 days, two weeks, um, to learn or become more practiced in um, calling fire, um, artillery fire, and, uh, and uh, aircraft, um, in hoping, sharpening my skills that, and increasing my chances of, of getting uh, what my recruiter told me I would have more choices, that was the choice I wanted to pursue. Right. A very important skill for a platoon leader, uh, of course. Um, and useful for anyone. Yeah. Um, but the uh, downside was that uh, unlike all the other folks who got shipped out immediately and who went to Vietnam, um, I had a little delay before I went. And as I uh, told you in our pre-interview discussion, um, even though your date of rank um, in terms of who had seniority among the officers of the same class was went by your basic school standing officially, unofficially what it went by was how long you'd been in country. Uh -huh. And so rather than advancing my um, status by going to this school, I in fact had um, set myself back by um, a small amount. Right. Just another one of the ironies. I, it, it's one of the, uh, the things that teaches you that the needs of a bureaucracy, whether it's military, um, governmental, or a civilian corporation, they're all bureaucracies and they all um, are interested in their own interests. And it, you know, before your interests are taken into account. So, of course, a good a good insight to have for the rest of, uh, of one's life. So you arrive in Vietnam when? Would have been the fall of '67. Uh -huh. I think uh, October, November. Right. Uh, at uh, Da Nang, which was the major uh, entry point, big air base in uh, the south southern portion of I Corps. Right. And. Uh, once again, I went in uh, to the uh, assignment officer. I'd learned to reinforce my notions of how bureaucracies work. He didn't. He had already decided where I was going. There wasn't any sort of back and forth about what I would like to do or my aspirations to go to a recon outfit. It was just here's where you're going, Jack. Um, yeah. And he sent me off to the Second Battalion, 26 Marines. And um, so, just to explain. Vietnam, at the, South Vietnam at that time was divided into four corps. So I Corps was the furthest north and tended to get a lot of action because you had North Vietnamese Army people that you were fighting rather than Viet Cong traditionally. Correct. Um, so it was a hot area, I Corps. I tell people this all the time, everyone has their own war. And generally, uh, I Corps um, would have received more action than most of the other places, but it depended on where you were right. um, and what the particular situation you were in. So sure. some people uh, wouldn't see very many shots fired in anger, and other people would have a, a horrible time. Yeah, and part of it was how close you were to the Cambodian or Laotian border versus how close you were to the sea. In, in general, yes, although I Corps also had a border with North Vietnam, and so the folks who were in the northernmost part of I Corps um, generally had the, the most likelihood of encountering combat. I remember one of the furthest north Special Forces camp, Lang, Lang Bay, was overrun by the North Vietnamese. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, your general duties as a platoon leader, I mean, and. When I. Uh, first came on, uh, we were sent uh, to a combat base called Fubai, which was a little bit south of Hue. Uh -huh. um, and that was about the first uh, three, four months of my time uh, there. And what we would do, um, I was sent to a, a battalion and then assigned to a company and got a platoon assigned to me. Um, and we would, at the time, what we were doing was um, patrol, um, platoon-sized patrols, and then at night setting squad ambushes. 
which meant the platoon would break up into its component squads, and assuming there were enough places to put them, we'd go out at night and set up an ambush on a trail or a trail junction somewhere. And the other duty that we, we had at that time um, was we did bridge security. Highway 1 was the main um, highway that ran up the coast, and uh, we would go out and detach a squad um, at each one of the bridges that we were assigned to try and keep that bridge open and uh, prevent it from being <coughs> destroyed. What was it like being a so-called green platoon leader, brand new, and you have to kind of win the confidence of your men? And uh, how'd that go? It was educational. <laughs> um, I, I tell you the uh, story of my first night in country. We had uh, gone out patrolling. You know, everyone is sort of. Uh, we're all new to each other, and they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them, and I'm trying to pretend I know what's going on, and um, and I did, you know, I, I received a good education in how to do this stuff, but um, actually doing it, as always, is a different thing. We had set up that um, late that afternoon. Um, I knew we had to set up squad-sized ambushes, and so I had picked out um, two locations, one to send one of the squads to. The other was a a kind of a trail junction that had a little bit of a, a dog leg in it <clears throat> next to a village. And since there weren't too many sites um, that would be useful, I thought, okay, we could put one squad facing down one trail and the other squad facing down the other trail. And I noticed as I was giving out my grand uh, assignment for the evening that people were turning their heads to the side, looking down. Um, obviously, there was some kind of an issue with this. And so I asked them, said I'd noticed that some of them uh, might have misgivings about this and what was that about. And my, uh, one of my squad leaders said, well, Lieutenant, you know, um, no, all, all respect and uh, not meaning to, you know, uh, contradict you, but in general, we don't like to have two groups of Marines out in the same area close enough to where if they start shooting, uh, they're liable to shoot each other. Right. Um, well, I figured since they were aimed in different directions, that wouldn't be a problem. But when I thought on it, um, obviously these people had been doing this. Um, and so we uh, reorganized my plan and yeah. um, set up three squad ambushes at different locations. And my uh, squad leader um, had told me a few months later, um, we were reminiscing about uh, beginning together, and he said, uh, we, we knew you would be okay the first day when you listened to us. Uh, yeah, and so um, I, I guess I, I survived my first encounter with actual leadership um, on, on the field uh, by paying attention. See, that's what intelligent platoon leaders did, was listen to the troops since they've been there for a while. And uh, I always find that my NCOs were three times smarter than me, and I was going to take any kind of advice I could get from them. You know, I, I would comment at this point that you don't realize in civilian life um, the role distance between officers and enlisted people in the military. It's not like a job. I mean, it's true you're a boss, um, but there is a, a role distance all the way up that's much more deeply ingrained than it is in anywhere in civilian life. Um, so there is a temptation to go in alone, um, since no one is going to contradict you um, or outright laugh in your face. Um, so it takes, um, you could overlook the fact that you had better listen to people and solicit their opinions. So tell us about the night you saw the uh, flares and moved towards them. Um, actually it was in the daytime. Um, okay. And pop-ups, you can see it sure. in, in, the, in the daylight. And in fact, um, red pop-ups were the signal for contact. Um, this was at the end of my time at, uh, at Fubai. And um, as I had told you, we didn't uh, see very much action, fortunately. Um, a couple of times we had uh, heard shots fired at one point uh, during a truce, which were the most dangerous times in those days, uh -huh. um, because people tended to let their guard down. Um, we had seen some action. There was a curfew, so if you were um, out at night and there was someone moving and it wasn't your people, um, they were a legitimate um, free fire target. There was some activity down the road from one of the bridges on which we were um, stationed and uh, we 
fired a couple of shots at them, they fired a couple back. One of them went literally right over my head and I involuntarily fell backwards off of the little concrete um, revetment that we were on. Fortunately, I was inebriated um, and uh, <laughs> did not suffer any damage as a result of that, but um, was a cautionary tale. Other than that, a few incidents in which um, there were a round or two, we hadn't seen any actual combat. Um, so to see the red pop-up going off, and I, I think I told you this, it, even though it seems silly now, um, you actually get eager to engage <clears throat> in some kind of meaningful activity. You don't want to go through your whole tour never having seen the enemy. Um, knowing what I know now <laughs> might be a different attitude, but in, then, in, in those times you wanted to do your job. So we saw the pop-ups, took off um, out to uh, where they were going off, and there was also small arms fire. Um, and uh, thinking that someone other than us um, had engaged um, and was in, co in combat and we were going to go up and support them. Uh, calling frantically on the radio, no one knew anything, um, no idea what's going on, what could this contact be, maybe a half a mile away. Um, but we moved along, I hope well spaced, since that was one of the, uh, the most important things, um, in a column to go to the place where the contact was. And by the end of it, we were sort of doing a fast shuffle, um, wanting to get there before um, it was too late. And I jumped across the stream bed and um, twisted my ankle very badly, landing in mud on the other side, which was a blessing in disguise, a, a reinforcement of a lesson that you knew, but um, is always more important if it's uh, reinforced with experience. And uh, I don't think I ever uh, move that fast um, to combat um, or to potential combat. Anyway, we came over the next hill, me limping along and the rest of the folks um, moving up. Um, and uh, there was a unit down on the road. We were overlooking them and it was a recon unit. Um, and I, by this time, was a little bit upset having done myself an injury um, and asked them, what was with the, the pop-up signifying contact. And uh, they said that uh, they were a recon unit, uh, separate outfits, they were, came from battalion level or division level, and they had come back in from the field and were approaching Highway 1, and that their practice was just to shoot off all of their ordnance so that they'd get a new supply of ordnance when they came in. So there hadn't been any contact at all. Um, I had made, at least in my own eyes, a fool of myself um, and had suffered an injury at the same time, notwithstanding learning some good lessons. Um, and so I was exasperated by this, but never received an explanation. Uh, no one ever explained to me why we didn't know they were there, uh, why they engaged in this dangerous practice, right. um, but just uh, you know, another piece of information about how the world works. Now, was this the time at, in which a boy loaned you a bicycle? Yeah, <clears throat> we, were, um, we were about a mile from Highway 1, uh -huh. and uh, my ankle was pretty messed up, um, and I, we needed to go back, I needed to be x-rayed. Um, and so we were uh, walking back to the road, so that I could pick up transportation back to the, um, the combat base and, and get a medical evaluation. And there were a couple of um, Vietnamese folks uh, walking down the road, and one of them was a little boy with a bicycle. And he walked the bicycle up to me and pointed to the bicycle and pointed to me and pointed to the bicycle. And um, I saw that he was offering for me to ride it, which was a great idea because I was sure. being shuffled along by someone um, holding me up from one shoulder to keep this foot off um, the ground. And so I, he walked along with us and the squad that was with me um, walked me out to the road. Um, and then when we got there, I gave him his bicycle back, uh, waiting for the truck. And I tried to give him some money for using the bicycle. And he absolutely insisted that 
this was not a monetary transaction. Um, and it, it brought tears to my eyes. Um, you know, it's the sort of, uh, the kindness of strangers. Um, even, even in war, even when, uh, you know, approaching an occupying power, there's still this, you know, common humanity that leads people to um, freely offer up um, their assistance. Um, it was, it was the best thing that happened all day, other than learning not to uh, be eager to engage. I'm glad you included that because we need a few positive stories every now and then uh -huh. about Vietnam, I think. Um, so you said this was about the end of your time at Phu Bai. Now, is this where you're going to become a weapons platoon leader after that or what? Yeah, I was uh, on uh, light duty and I had to get around on crutches for three weeks or so. And um, I couldn't be a, a line a platoon commander uh, doing these uh, patrols and ambushes. And so I was given the uh, weapons platoon. Uh, we were uh, stocking up at the time, and uh, we had a lot of lieutenants coming in, and so there were enough lieutenants to cover all the billets. Normally the weapons platoon uh, would not have an, ex an officer because they were mostly detached out to the, uh, the line platoons. They consisted of machine guns and mortars, and so they would break up, um, send a couple of machine guns with each platoon, and a, a mortar potentially. Um, and then they would be used by the platoons rather than being uh, held separate. But I was responsible for their administration and then when we moved to our next location actually uh, setting them up because they were kept as a unit uh, there. And the machine guns, were they M60s or 50 calibers? Or 60s. Okay. And 60 or 81 mortars? 60s. Okay. Uh, and you're in a different area now when you're a weapons platoon leader, right? Right, well, sure. After that, a couple of weeks after that, um, was the beginning of Tet. Um, and so we were at Fubai, which was outside Hue, and um, other unit, we were assigned orders to go to Da Nang, and other units came in and took up um, the positions that we'd had along Highway 1, outside Hue. Um, and at the beginning of Tet, they came under heavy fire. The same places that we had been a week or two before um, were now um, major combat theaters with the NVA mainline forces uh, who were moving in to take way. Um, and so just the happenstance of how things happen in, in the military. Um, we'd been there for three months, nothing happening. Um, we get ready to move off um, to Quezon and uh, all of a sudden hell's a popping. Um, so the timing was, uh, in some respects, uh, quite felicitous. Yeah, I'll say. Um, now, eventually, you're outside of Quezon, as I understand it. Right. We flew into Quezon um, in helicopters as a battalion. Uh -huh. um, all of our operations before essentially had been company level or uh, platoon level. And now we were actually the whole um, battalion unit. Uh, we flew in, landed on the helicopters. As I tell you, everybody got off the helicopters, looked around at all of the mountains that surrounded Quezon and said, this would be a great place to build a French fort. Um, <laughs> and reenact Diem Ben Phu. Exactly. The, the thought that was on everyone's mind. Yeah. Um, and uh, then we marched out after marshalling uh, at the uh, airfield at Quezon um, out to a position in a valley between two of the main um, high points, um, which was a potential uh, attack route for tanks um, coming into, and the North Vietnamese did have some um, armored vehicles there. I mean, it was a North Vietnamese operation as opposed to a Viet Cong operation at Khe Sanh. So we were in the valley in a battalion perimeter um, set up around a couple of very low hills and surrounded by mountains. I, you know, for lack of a better word, sure. um, on all sides. And I read a recent track on Quezon just to kind of refresh my memory. Yes. I think I've read every book on Vietnam, but uh, it talked about essentially at Quezon there were 6,000 Marines surrounded by 40,000 NVA. So you're outnumbered almost seven to one. Yes, and the, all these things uh, become more obvious um, after the fact. Um, 
we didn't know the specifics of what the you know the placements were. You don't have a newspaper. There's no internet in those days. Um, you're just you know out there. And actually, in some respects, the rumors are more um, scary than the facts might be. Uh, and uh, with the president of the NBN Fu in everyone's mind, sitting out there in a valley and realizing that we were a actually engaged with the North Vietnamese Army as opposed to irregular forces. Right. Um, it was a sobering situation. So they have tanks, rockets, artillery, um, and some of these, some of this artillery was coming all the way from Laos. Yeah, most, as I had said, you know, most places where we were, we never were in a situation where we didn't have artillery superiority including air superiority. But at Quezon, whenever the North Vietnamese did an operation, they were not as rich as we were. They did not have the opportunity to truck everything in um, on helicopters and move um, with a ready resupply route. So they had to plan things long in advance, right. um, set up big supply caches um, from which they could then operate. And in, in the particular case of Quezon, set up the infrastructure for an assault. Um, and that included, in Laos, there were um, mountainous cave formations. And inside these caves, they had dug in their artillery pieces and actually had them set up on uh, little segments of railroad track so that they could pull them back into the cave um, whenever they came under fire um, and then roll them out and employ them uh, as soon as the fire ceased. So normally in a big set-piece artillery battle, um, the main thing that goes on is what's called counter-battery fire. Um, you want to knock out first the enemy's artillery so that you have your artillery set up to support your infantry operations or tank operations or whatever. In Quezon, couldn't knock out the NVA artillery uh, capabilities because they were in these um, cave situations where as soon as you got air superiority or brought air on station, um, they'd pull them back into the caves. And so for the most of the duration of the battle, um, which I did not see the end of, um, they maintained um, at least artillery parity um, in the theater. And we were shelled uh, with some frequency out in this battalion um, perimeter, uh, not um, every day, but um, often enough to keep you on your toes. Quezon was shelled persistently. Right. Um, and there was no way to stop this um, from happening, given the, the clever um, infrastructure that they had set up. And they probably had uh, key sites zeroed in, uh, like the airstrips and maybe ammo dump or, or yeah. the talk or whatever. Yeah, everywhere. Um, when you are normally working with artillery, the whole thing is to get the artillery, coordinate with the artillery and get them on target have the shells falling where you want them to. And when you're in a fluid situation, uh, that takes a certain amount of time and artfulness. You have to call in the coordinates that you think the target's at. They have to put that information on the guns, and then you have to adjust that fire right. and move it normally by bracketing, by shooting over, splitting the difference, getting closer and closer until finally you're on target. And then at that point, you can call in for um, a fire for effect the whole battery will end up firing on that particular pinpoint, which is where you want the fire directed. They had been doing this for so long um, that they had everything completely gridded out, and so there was no need to adjust the fire. They could immediately um, call for fire for effect on any of the places they wanted to hit. Um, and so they were even in a, a more useful situation than artillery normally is, uh, because there was no time lapse necessary to adjust the fire. And it was dur during this period that you, they asked for volunteers, officers, to pick up the pay. Yeah, well, the, the pay had to be transported. It was in um, MPC, cash, right. um, military payment certificates. We hadn't been paid for a while out there in, this, in the sticks, and th there were no stores or movies or anything, um, but people still need money um, to buy money orders, uh, to settle their gambling debts, to... Uh, trade for their uh, favorite sea rations. Uh, if you wanted peaches, you could buy them for peaches, a premium. Peaches, number one. Um, 
and so someone had to go back and, and uh, pick up the uh, the payroll, and for me that was a, that was fine. Uh, we were bored, not, notwithstanding being shelled occasionally, um, and so I agreed to go and, and uh, take a helicopter back to Quezon and then take transportation from there uh, back to Da Nang and pick up the payroll and bring it back. So what happens? So I went back to uh, Da Nang and uh, went back to, to uh, Quezon and borrowed a camera, as it, as it turned out, um, from uh, one of the guys who was a cook, actually. A little Instamatic, bought myself a roll um, of film, and I walked around Quezon uh, taking pictures. And that morning, uh, my transportation wasn't scheduled until the afternoon. Uh, as much as anything is scheduled in, in those kinds of environments. Uh, that morning, there was a fixed-wing um, aircraft that had been shelled while it was trying to land the day before. And they had repaired it and set it up to fly out. Uh, and as it rolled down the runway uh, to take off, uh, in came the, the artillery fire and uh, blew it up. And it was sort of standing on the airfield uh, with a big column of uh, fire and smoke coming out of it, fairly dramatic. So I took pictures of that. I walked around and took pictures of a lot of things at Quezon, um, near our um, battalion headquarters, which wasn't much but a supply depot, and uh, played chess with some of the guys and uh, looked at, uh, you know, you sort of noticed where the tanks were, where the artillery were, what the uh, one of the things I noticed was that all of the tents, because the, uh, there were sandbags up the sides, uh, but the top was a tent, had little holes from shrapnel, so you could tell that um, the artillery fire was coming in regularly, right. uh, because there wasn't even time to re repair these little uh, shrapnel fragments. Uh, so I walked around and uh, took some pictures, and then I went over to the uh, LZ, which was outside the battalion aid station, um, or the regimental aid station, I guess, um, at Quezon, and um, waited for my call. We were on, um, didn't have wands like we have the restaurants now, but uh, we would have a runner come and call out um, what your priority was. There was a bunker that you could wait in, but it was a pretty unpleasant place. Um, shelling was going on all day long, uh, shifting from place to place within the combat base, uh, depending on what their uh, priorities were. Yeah, so um, when, I, when they were going to shell, I was curious because they were in, in Laos, you could hear the guns go off in Laos. And you would hear that before the shells, which were following an arc, came down. And so people would yell, incoming, either when they heard the guns go off in Laos, um, or uh, when the first uh, crump hit um, somewhere on the combat base. And so as soon as you got the call of incoming, people would sound it out, you would run and try and find shelter somewhere, um, anywhere. If you were in the bunker, that was fine. If you weren't, and I was out um, at the end of the day from the bunker, I just couldn't stand being in the inside anymore. Um, and uh, calls of incoming came and I was in a, uh, on the edge of the airfield, there were a lot of munitions stacked up, a lot of supplies, and there were some huge tires, and I mean really huge, uh, that were stacked up on top of each other. And I slid in under the tire, uh, under one of these giant tires, uh, until there was a lull in the, uh, in the incoming. And then I told myself it was time to get out of there and go um, get in the bunker. Um, and I remember the sensation. I was in a semi-fetal position, curled up under this tire, um, ordering my body to get out from under there. And my body, which had been, my mind, uh, which had been subjected to this sort of back and forth all day long, um, running and hiding, nothing going on, being bored, um, being terrified under this tire, and my body absolutely refused to move. And it took about 
20, 30 seconds, maybe. No, you were uh, telling it to move. I'm saying, okay, let's go. <laughs> move, no, um, absolutely, we're not going to do that. Um, and it was a very strange sensation. Um, in any event, the uh, paralysis dissipated. I got out from under it, went back to the bunker. Um, and then um, got the call that our transportation was coming in, finally and went out to the uh, edge of the uh, landing zone, the LZ, to wait for the helicopters to come down. And um, as I say, there were these munitions stacked on pallets, um, and there was something stacked on a pallet on the edge of the LZ, and I was standing behind the pallet, so I was covered up to my um, chest level, um, looking at the LZ, and I still had the camera, and I was taking pictures. Um, and some of these are in the, the pictures that I um, posted for you guys. Um, the LZ was just uh, sandbagged around, and then these uh, metal strips, and the helicopters would come down and, and land on the metal strip. And on the edge of it, on one side, um, was an ABC camera crew, and they were taking pictures um, of the helicopter coming in, and also of the wounded being carried out because they had first priority from the regimental aid station uh -huh. um, to be put into the helicopters and the helicopter coming down to land. I took my last picture of the helicopter coming down to land, um, took out the um, cartridge, the little Instamatics had a little metal cartridge and put it in my um, jacket pocket and then turned around to watch the, the loading continue and the uh, one unfortunate thing about the helicopters, one of many unfortunate things, um, I don't ride them now unless I absolutely have to, um, was that when the helicopters came in, they make an enormous amount of noise. And so you couldn't hear the guns going off in Laos. Um, and so the next um, thing that occurred was, and I have described this you before, it was like being hit by a sharp aligner um, in the infield um, in my left shoulder, um, but sharper than any liner. Um, fortunately, I was wearing my flak jacket um, and also hit in the face. And you can see under my right eye, there are still um, tattoos. Um, when I go in for a dentist appointment now, the dentist invariably says, why is there metal in your, you know, around this tooth? Uh, there's still little, little pieces of shrapnel there. Um, none of this was known to me at the time. I slapped my hand over my eye, um, dropped to the ground behind the pallet, and um, started yelling Corman, because that's what you um, do in the Marine Corps. You yell medic, I think, in the Army, and Correct. you yell Corman. Um, but then I noticed there were lots of other people yelling Corman. And slowly, my mentation came back online, um, and I realized I was not going to be the, the uh, first priority for the corpsman, and I had better um, head over to the regimental aid station myself. Um, so I stood up and uh, sort of hunched um, over to the road that, that led to the aid station. At some point, some more artillery must have come in, because I have one little hole in my back, uh, which would not have been in the first barrage. Uh, but I didn't even notice it at the time. Um, and as I was headed to the, the uh, regimental aid station, <coughs> Corman came out. He was headed for the LZ uh, to try and attend. Lots of Corman came out. One of them came running up, put his hand on my shoulder, and said, where are you hit? And the only thing I was concerned about at the time was my eye, because your eyes have this special significance um, in sure. terms of injury, probably only up there with your genitals as things that you would uh, be concerned about. And he said, okay, lift your hand off and I'll take a look at it. And I did. And he said, I don't think, I think your eye is okay. Um, it's just you know, chopped up around it. And I remember this feeling of intense relief, um, physical relief um, at being told that that was the case. And he continued off to the, uh, the LZ to do his job, and I um, 
punched it down into the, the regimental aid station and got uh, triaged and um, cleaned up and ready to be medevac with the people I had seen before at the LZ being carried out to this uh, the very same spot. And then the day continued. Um, eventually, I, I have no idea how much time runs in these situations. You know, sure. No watch and um, time is a, a malleable thing. Uh, one of the things you, you get when you're involved in uh, small arms fire is time dilation, I would call it. You know, it's an Einsteinian phenomenon. Um, time slows down um, and it, it just seems like uh, there's a distortion, like you're watching things in slow motion. Right. In any event, I eventually was uh, on the stretcher and, and uh, carried out from the aid station to get transported uh, back to the hospital. And uh, it was eerie because we were going back to the same place where I'd seen the wounded going on the helicopters before and where I'd been um, hit uh, by the Artie. And that was um, scary, shall we say. And I think I explained to you, I was holding the sides of the stretcher um, and I felt like um, I was as rigid as a board. Uh, this was the most whomped I had ever been, <clears throat> including all day long at this, um, this place. And I was holding everything rigidly. There's this thing where you try by force of will to protect yourself, even if it's irrational, like lack of force of will or my body's will under that tire. Um, but I was absolutely stone rigid being carried out to this helicopter. These are the twin rotor big six course. Yeah, the, one, um, the ones that came in the first time um, were those ones with the big fat front, um, sort of a fat Huey or something. They were uh, not our helicopters. The Marines had these. Uh, sea stallions and had a rotor in the front and a rotor in the back. So that was the kind that <clears throat> was coming in when I was uh, brought out to be loaded. And uh, the stretcher bearers um, literally ran out. Everything was you know, under time pressure to get this helicopter loaded as fast as possible. And they were set up with uh, like bunk bed slots on the side of the helicopters that they were used for medevacs all the time. And so they ran me into the helicopter along with other wounded people and clipped me into the side of the helicopter um, and ran out the back. A uh, couple of other people ran on and with no um, warning or not so much as a fairly well, up we went um, off from the ground. And um, enormous feeling of relief again physically washing through your body, uh, my body, and we went up and, you know, I'm thinking this is, we're out of here. Um, I have, by force of will, gotten us out of here by, you know, um, like you do with your kids sometimes, you know, you, even though you're a thousand miles away, you're steering them through their, their crises. I was in control somehow with my will. Um, the helicopter went up and it didn't veer off, it began to go in a circle um, over the LZ, high enough up so it was out of the arty. <clears throat> and the crew chief came back from um, the front of the helicopter where the pilots are, and he said, we didn't get a full load. We're going to go back as soon as they suppress the fire. Um, they had pulled us up because the arty was coming in again. Um, and I, I I don't have words to describe um, the realization that we're going back to the exact same place again. Um, Especially with having seen a helicopter being blown up just uh, moments before. See, been there and done that. Um, yeah. But it was so strange. Um, after all day going back and forth, um, boredom, terror, boredom, terror. It was like uh, working a piece of wire to try and break it. Something snapped at that point. Um, and I don't say that as a bad thing. It, I say that as a good thing. Um, it was a curious 
um, something gave in my psyche is the only way I can, can articulate it. And I was no longer afraid. Uh, it, um, something relaxed. And I, the only way I can articulate it after the fact is to say that um, I didn't, everybody knows intellectually they're going to die. Um, but I knew at this point, not only was I going to die, um, but that it was not up to me. I would not be able to control it. I would not have, by force of will, by karma, by cleverness, by physical attributes, by anything. Um, and I knew that not intellectually, but physiologically, experientially. Um, that there was not a damn thing I could do about death when it came. Uh, and, and I tell you my description of this feeling, uh, when I was a young man I, I, in Florida, when we'd go back to visit my mom's folks, we would go to these revival meetings. Uh, and they were Baptist and they were fire and brimstone and the whole deal, but you keep these phrases that you hear, you know, even if you're no longer religious, if you've been brought up in the biblical tradition, you remember Bible stories. And there was a phrase in one of the hymns that they sang at one of these revival meetings um, called the peace that patheth all understanding. Um, and that was the way I felt um, after this announcement. First, this terror that went right off the scale, and then, whoop, um, you know, a peace. chaotic, um, different state of mind. Um, and it didn't bother me. I mean, we went down, uh, landed. I wasn't anxious about getting out. I wasn't, it was okay. Um, because I was not in control of the horizontal. I was not in control of the vertical. And I knew that um, in a way that uh, has stayed with me ever since that day. And although I couldn't give you specific, um, this changed because of that or that changed because of that, that was a fundamental life change for me. Um, more so than being shot, um, having this epiphany um, that I, that death was not a thing that humans um, can beat um, or avoid or somehow um, avert. It was going to happen. Right. Um, changed a lot of my attitudes about life. Um, didn't make me a serious person. I'd already been a serious person as a result of uh, the discipline that I had had instilled and the responsibility of being a platoon commander. Uh, but it definitely changed um, some unnameable, unknowable psychic components um, and uh, made me a better guy. Um, you. Uh, just a couple of little odds and ends here I wanted to talk about before we leave Vietnam, and that is um, you talked about how um, the evolution of a soldier or uh, a Marine or anyone who's in combat went versus what you're thinking when you first get there and how that evolves. Um, you said initially, at first, you just wanted to be a hero and win the war. Well, the Marine Corps has this phrase, gung-ho. Right. Um, and it came from operations in China, I guess. And I don't know what the literal translation is, but it means um, full of zeal, um, you know, ready to go. Um, and, um, you know, up the hill. And when, you, when we first arrived, when I first arrived, um, we were gung-ho. I mean, I wanted to be in recon. Um, I wanted to get into the action. I wanted to see combat. Um, wanted to win the war. Um, that's what we. That's still the the psychology that was prevalent at that time. Changed afterwards, and it changed also as we were there as a result of both being there and seeing things happen. Um, by the end of the of the the time um, that I was a platoon leader. It, it was less about winning the war or doing something heroic or getting a medal um, than it was about um, 
horizontal loyalty and getting as many people out of this situation at the end of it as possible. Um, it's true, you were a Marine, you were always going to do your best to accomplish your mission, but there was a certain attitudinal thing about um, how hard you were going to push it, uh, where you were going to look, what sterns you were going to turn over, how eager you would be to um, run into the bear. Um, and by the I don't know, three months or so into it, um, it was definitely a, our, our real ultimate strategic objective here is to get as many people out of this alive um, and unmarred as possible. Right. Um, and I don't know if that's a process that occurs ubiquitously or um, only to some. Definitely occurred. So you left Vietnam when? Uh, Sometime, we had 13 month tours. I think I might have had a couple of weeks early. So, sometime, this was the, the day I left Quezon was March the 8th. Um, and we left Vietnam the next fall. Um, it, I was medevaced out, uh, went to Japan to a third echelon hospital, um, got surgery on my shoulder, and then spent a couple of weeks uh, in the hospital, a couple of weeks on Okinawa, <clears throat> and then was sent back in country. Um, went back to another assignment officer and selection officer um, and had the um, this grown up experience, this thing that was entirely different from when I had shown up for my first assignment um, when I was looking to get a recon assignment um, off into the, the heavy combat thing. He actually uh, was willing to talk back and forth with me and I sat down in his tent and he said um, you know when folks come back in country after they've been wounded um, I usually um, give them an option about whether they want to go back to a line outfit um, or they would um, rather do something else what do you want to do and I remember very distinctly this again to time sort of slowing down um, saying um, okay I I'd be happy with another job, um, and it was a part of the maturation process. Um, again, I was not afraid of going to a line outfit if that's what I had been sent to do. I would have done it, um, but I was no longer interested in volunteering for a line billet. So I got assigned to a um, combat base in uh, Oh, let's see, Dong Ha, which was uh, on the northern border river between uh, North Vietnam and, and South Vietnam at the time. And got a billet at the base level as a what they call a defense coordinator. And um, essentially coordinated between the various units that were tenants at the combat base, um, how they were going to run their perimeter defense, um, keeping track of them, uh, making sure they fulfill their commitments for the number of people they had on the line outside the combat base, that sort of stuff, a more bureaucratic kind of job. Although we did go out and <coughs> do patrols occasionally um, from the, you know, just to keep the perimeter clear around the end. And uh, there were two of us, and the guy who was in uh, the bunker with me, because we were down in a bunker, which is a great place to sleep after you've been sleeping out in the field, including in the monsoons. Um, was a guy named Ken Black, who I was one of the few people I've managed to maintain contact with um, throughout the whole thing. And I have to tell you the story I don't think we discussed very briefly. Take as much time as you want. Um, Ken and I got to be, you know, very good friends. And um, I remember this evening we were down and I was reading Stars and Stripes, which was the military newspaper um, at the time we would get occasionally. It was essentially our only source of news. Um, and there were, to the credit of whoever ran Stars and Stripes, that they would even mention such a thing, stories about the protests um, back in the United States about the war. And uh, I was reading the article and <coughs> Ken was sitting next to me and I said, Ken, uh, I understand these people's rights to protest I support their rights to protest. I don't have any problems with their rights to protest. But what they don't understand is we've lost 
I don't know what the number was at the time, 30,000 people here. Um, and you can't walk away from that. And Ken turned to me and looked at me, this frown on his face, and he said, Murphy, you are a really smart guy, but sometimes you are so full of shit. <laughs> and it, it was, again, one of these epiphany moments, you know. Um, he was exactly right. I was exactly wrong. Um, and it's one of the many benefits I have received uh, from that friendship. Uh, it is never an excuse to continue to get more people killed that you've got people killed before. Um, that's juvenile thinking. Um, and hopefully has been eradicated from our worldview, but I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. Okay, once you left Vietnam, you still have time in the Marine Corps, so how did you do the rest of your sentence? I went back to uh, Camp Pendleton, uh -huh. which is where the West Coast Infantry Training Regiment um, right. is conducted. They have their boot camp in um, San Diego, and then they go to ITR in Pendleton. And I was there a, with a line outfit for a while um, that was in a, a barrack situation, not for long, maybe six months. <laughs> and then I spent the rest of the time in the Infantry Training Regiment as a uh, company commander there, basically training recruits in all of the infantry skills uh, that they need to, to have to go off and be Marines. Uh, a much, uh, much calmer environment, um, and uh, finished up in that billet, um, and then got out of the Marine Corps. Did you develop an affinity for California at that point, being an East Coast lad? Uh, you know, it's uh, and, and it certainly has been true with my children. Um, you know, that need to break away from your childhood environment. Um, I'm certainly satisfied by being 3,000 miles away on the exact opposite coast. Right. I did like California, and uh, it just seemed like and I don't know that I even thought about it the right thing to do. Um, so I uh, moved up to San Francisco and. Um, because I had botched my academic efforts earlier so badly, um, I had to go back and finish up. Um, and I finished up at USF. Um, and uh, again, something I attribute to the military service. Um, I was totally uninterested in politics before. Now I was intensely interested in politics. Um, and so I did it what would have been an unthinkable shift from all of my earlier work and uh, finished out what they call a government um, minor um, at USF. Um, much better than my earlier academic efforts and uh, then went to uh, uh, Berkeley Law School across the bay. At Bolt. At Bolt. Yeah. Um, and then took a job with uh, California Rural Legal Assistance, uh, which is a Legal Aid Poverty Program in uh, Marysville and Yuba City. Did that for four years. Uh -huh. so, something about four years that seems to uh, <laughs> resonate. And uh, then um, the uh, President Reagan had been elected and the uh, funding for legal aid was being cut back. So uh, my wife and I needed a job that would be secure between us at least. So I went to work for the Court of Appeal over in the Library and Courts building across from the Capitol and uh, finished out my uh, legal career there. Okay. And you finished that at what point in time? Well, actually I had a failed retirement. <laughs> um, I attempted to retire the government pension. Um, I don't know why we could afford them before, but we can't do it now um, since we're so much richer now. Um, it was quite ample for my modest needs. Uh, my dad was a cop, and so everything I'd been paid as a lawyer has seemed like more money than any, any person deserves to be paid, even if it's a government salary. Uh, but I retired early, when I was 56, um, and I think I ended up with almost two-thirds of my pay if you count the fact you don't have to pay Social Security income when you receive retirement um, or Medicare tax. But both of my kids um, had done well in school. Uh, my daughter got into an Ivy League, or one of the seven sisters at Wellesley. My son uh, graduated from 
college late. He's 14 years older than my daughter. Um, had a checkered childhood. I don't know what to attribute that to, where that could have come from. And he got into med school. And so between the two of those um, financial obligations, I had to go back to work. And I worked as a retired annuitant for another six or eight years. Um, and then retired finally when both of them graduated um, from their respective uh, schools. Yeah. So you went back to the Court of Appeal. I went back to the Court of Appeal as a retired annuitant. Okay. And I worked at, a, you know, at that. It was enough money to to keep them from having an albatross around their neck when they got out of school and uh, um, set them on their way. Yeah. Well, what a terrific story. Well, thank you. And uh, I didn't have anything to do with plotting it. The story <laughs> arc was entirely generated uh, by the world. I, it was really a pleasure to interview you today. I'm going to give you a virtual handshake. All right. And thank I you. have that sniffle. Yeah, and thank you for your service. Well, thank yeah. you for spending yeah. the time to put this together well, and uh, working hard on it. It's a joy. This is our 55th or 56th. I can't remember which, so I'll do it forever as long as they let me. All right. Or I die. Uh, Thanks again. Thank you. So this ends uh, today's episode of Valley to Vietnam. Uh, join us again for the next one. Thank you.